it's Jeff Chalmers here from discoverdoublebass.com, which is the home of online learning for double bass players with our courses, lessons, and interviews. And I'm here today joined by a wonderful artist who is known for uh, her music playing with people like uh, Nushka Shankar, Akram Khan, and Katie Mellower. But she's also a wonderful uh, performer in her own right, playing her music as a solo double bassist and singer. She's performed at some big events, big festivals such as Glastonbury, Latitude, Cambridge Folk Festival. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Nina Harry. So Nina, thanks for joining me today. Oh, thanks for having me. Well, it's really cool of you to come up and share your music. But before we get stuck into hearing some of your pieces, maybe you could just give us a little bit of information about the origins of how you came up and uh, started learning the double bass. What's your background? So I come from a family of musicians and um, my dad's a double bassist as well. So I grew up watching him play. And um, since I was little, I started, I tried violin, I tried all the, so many instruments. I think I almost played all of them, but I was never any good. And that really annoyed me because my brother, my mum, my dad, my sister, they all had their instruments and they were very proficient. And I just like, no matter what I tried, nothing sounded any good. And then I think I must have got to like 14, 15. And then finally I thought, you know what? I must be big enough now to have a go on the double bass. <laughs> and I did. And it was, yeah, it was, um, if not love at first sight, it was, it was cordial. And were you playing, uh, what, what kind of stuff were you playing at that time? Were you playing like more pop contemporary music or were you playing classical stuff or? Well, I was playing in the, uh, the, the Northamptonshire County Youth Orchestra. That was kind of my classical side. And I was having lessons with a, ba with a great bass player, Peter Smith, who was kind of introducing me to the world of classical bass, reluctantly yeah. on my part a little bit. Um, but I was mostly playing in bands. I played with a lot of kind of punk rock, punk folk bands in Northampton, because Northampton's a real like hub for bands. It always has been. So played a lot of music, folk, Americana, punk, metal, just anything really that I could could find a space for a bass. Well, it's fantastic. And then now you're all doing this, uh, these solo pieces and you've released your album recently, which is Nina Harry's. That's it. That's yeah. it, doesn't no it? No name. Yeah, yeah. Something of a name. So we'll be providing links to that, but we thought we could start off by featuring one of your pieces. So we're gonna hear you perform Heavy Doubt. Um, yeah. Yeah, so let's cut to that now. Yeah. 
So Nina, one of the things that struck me about this piece is the tuning of your instrument. Let us know you're tuning differently, aren't you, I think? I am, yeah. What, what are you doing in terms of the, uh, the tuning? Um, it's very simple. I just tune the E string down to D. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like this instrument, specifically this bass, prefers it. Yeah. She has more ring. All of her wolf notes disappeared. You know, I just, it gives you more freedom harmonically as well. And are you thinking in terms of, like, are you thinking in terms of the notes then all changing or do you still think of it as an E string and or how? It's, it depends what I'm playing because that song, Heavy Doubt, I wrote it way before I learned about changing tunings. So that, that song originally had an open E string. Right. So I actually had to kind of rearrange that song for an open D. So when I play that song, I am really thinking like, it's not an E, it's not an E anymore. Yeah. But when I play with artists like my, my friends Anishka or Akram, I have always had the drop D. So I don't think about it and it's perfectly natural. So it, yeah, it depends. I think if I was doing some classical music, I think I'd probably be in trouble. Yeah, I, I mean, I love it though, because I think it just gives, straight away, it gives the bass a different kind of sound. Maybe you wouldn't mind just playing the main, the main pattern again, just so we can kind of hear that and just see it in this context. And this percussion is really cool as well. Who are, is this a journey that you kind of explored on your own? Where did you get the inspiration for that? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd never really seen bass players do it, but I grew up listening to this guitarist, John Gomm, who's very famous for his Also percussion. from Leeds as well. Hey, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it was funny because I've always listened to him and always really admired the stuff that he was doing with the percussion element. And I just kind of one day I thought, you know what, there must be if I write a simple enough line that has a gap, maybe I can. And I started to improvise and experiment with all the different sounds. And now there's almost every studio session I do, people always ask me, can you just do a bit of a... Yeah. Yeah, just a bit. I like the way that also with the right hand, you're kind of actually playing a defined rhythm as well. You're not, yeah. it's not just like, you're, you're not just going up the bass, you're playing. Oh, the... Yeah, because you can yeah. kind of hear the, would you mind playing it one more time? And then also we'll listen out for what you're doing with the left hand as well and then we can maybe speak about that, so. Yeah. I love, and I love the echo. Of course, it sounds great in this really vibrant yeah. room, doesn't it? And with the, yeah, it's really, it's a really cool thing. Do you have any other pieces where you're playing a percussion on the bass that you can kind of think of that feature that? Yeah, I do. I have um, a song called Will I'm Not, which is a song about not being Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> and that's like...
Yeah, that sounds absolutely that sounds absolutely awesome. And then in terms of like when you're composing this uh, this stuff, are you always working on the bass? Is it that you're coming up with a pattern that you, how does it work? What's the process look like? Songwriting for me has always been a little bit of a struggle and I always blame the bass for that <laughs> because I'm always complaining to my friends like, I can't think of anything. I must have, there can't be that many things you can do. So I always try and start from bass. Yeah. Because I like to have a, I find a loop not using pedals, I like to do it all organically, but I find a loop, something that I can, once I've practiced and learnt it, I can basically leave my left and right hands doing their business, and then I can concentrate on what I'm doing with my lungs. Yeah, and how does that work in terms of the singing? Do you, I, I find it so hard to even do anything else other than play the bass. It's hard enough already. But it like, is hard enough already, did, did yeah. You practice that, did you practice that kind of stuff? Did you, have you got any tips for people who are singing and playing the bass? Yeah, I used to do this funny thing at college, which would drive my friends in the next practice rooms crazy because um, it's all about being able to work at the same time and then leave that time and be able to be free rhythmically with your voice and not tied to the rhythm of the bass part. And that's one of the hardest things, I think, is to separate yourself rhythmically. It's like with a pianist yeah. where the two hands are doing separate rhythms. I can't do that at all. My hands are in one rhythm and then my lungs are in another. But I used to do a thing where like, I would practice, like I'd play a C major scale and I'd sing a C sharp major scale uh. and things like that. I'm not gonna demonstrate <laughs> yeah. it because it sounds horrible. But like, it's really good because it, you're working together rhythmically, but tonally you're apart. And then you can try things like singing the same scale as the one you're playing to work with intonation. Or, but then you can do different rhythms, try and do different rhythms with your voice. I like da 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 practicing different harmonies and scales and but it's very complicated I remember once in a practice room I had a very strange epiphany almost where it was like I could it was almost synesthesia I could see two corridors very clearly in my head one was where the bass was going and one was where the voice was going and I was really struggling with this one bar of this piece I was trying to learn and then I remember it so clearly it was like when you cross your eyes and the two things the two corridors just kind of melted into one and then from that moment on, I found I could play and sing so much easier. But it was a very strange, it was almost spiritual <laughs> experience. I, well, I look, I look, you can hear this comes across in the way that you play, because I think with your compositions, you've got this kind of real rooted kind of bass patterns, which are really, these figures which are really kind of clear and, and have this kind of movement. But then your voice is just so, like rhythmically and, and harmonically, it just feels like it's up there. Why don't we um, have a look at one of your other pieces? So I'm thinking about the one, um, baby, when, better when you're back, babe. Yeah. Go on then. Let's cut to you performing this because I think your voice sounds incredible in this context. And I also love the bass line. So we're going to hear a little bit of Nina performing better when you're back, babe. A cloud bank on my river, oh my God. 
Yeah, so there's all these beautiful harmonics in this piece. Is, uh, is that a big part of your playing and kind of adding in these different textures and, uh, you know, in your composition? Yeah, I mean, I found harmonics to be a very useful thing with the bass because when you're in the lower registers, you can't do too much stuff because if you're too busy down there, it'll become muddy and people won't be able to maybe hear the lyrics or like, especially if you're playing with pickups, like low stuff yeah. can be a bit of a nightmare. And so I started experimenting with harmonics through my teacher, Enno Semft. He, he, we spent a whole day once. He was just like, yeah, you've got this one and you've got this one and this one. And it was amazing. Like there were so many more than I ever realized. Because you studied at Royal College in London. Yeah. And you obviously have been playing, you know, you'd been playing a lot of classical stuff, a lot of contemporary classical music as well, I'm guessing. That was my favorite thing to do. Yeah. Like the contemporary, that was the music that made me stay at the RCM. Are, are there any uh, pieces or composers that you want to point towards in that genre, you know? Well, I, I never did a lot of repertoire solo, mm. but there were, I suppose there were two pieces that really caught my attention. And um, one was uh, Figment 3 by Elliot Carter. Okay. My dad actually got me onto that piece because he was like, I've always loved this piece and I think maybe you're ready to learn this. So yeah. I did it in my last year at college. And then the other piece was, which was the one I mentioned earlier about when I had the synesthesia moment, yeah. which is called Yes, I Said Yes, I Will Yes by Amy Beth Kirsten. And it's written for a double bassist and a soprano. And I went to see my teacher Enno perform it at the riot on, with the riot ensemble. And um, they had obviously the two performers and I was watching the gig and I was like, this piece is amazing. But mostly in my head, I was like, I could do this piece, but I could do both parts, not just one of the parts, I could do both. And that really woke me up to the idea of combining the two. So that piece is amazing. And one day my dream is that I will record the whole thing, just me. Oh, well, we'll, look forward, <laughs> we'll look forward to that. Let's hear a bit of the bass line then, if you, if you don't mind. It would be great to hear these harmonics popping out. And, and I think it's really interesting the way that when the chord, uh, when the harmony changes to D, you're moving down to the lower D. Yeah. I, that's one thing I love about the tuning straight away. Maybe just... Beautiful, I love it. I love it. It's a really kind of, but it's got such momentum and then with your voice over the top of it, uh, it's really good. When we were warming up, I heard you play another piece and I was thinking, I need to hear this, but it sounds like it's a work in progress. Maybe you could let us know a little bit about, about this one and maybe give us a bit of a sneak peek. Yeah, so this piece is called Water and it's the finale of my new EP, which I'm currently recording on board my narrowboat where I live. I bought all the studio things, all the computer things, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to record this EP as my second album, I suppose. And yeah, this track is called Water. I haven't written the vocals for it yet because it's the culmination of a long journey on that EP, and it has to be quite hopeful. 
and have a lot of trouble with positive lyrics. So, <laughs> but we've got the bass part to show you. So. That's beautiful. Just honestly, I can't say enough good stuff, you know, about your playing, and it's just Thank been you. such a pleasure to hear you. Um, you know, your your journey into kind of classical music and you know the Royal College, and you've obviously played a lot of different stuff. Do you have any advice for bass players who are struggling with this this balance of kind of meeting the demands of like a more formal education and you know finding your own voice as an artist? Is there anything that we could maybe talk speak to on that just before we wrap up? Yeah, I mean, I went to the RCM under, in shock because I never thought I'd get in, you know, and it was quite a baptism of fire for me. I, I, I didn't really come from a particularly classical background, whereas most of the people there did. So I felt very behind all the time and I didn't work in the same way as everyone else. And while I love classical music and I love to listen to it and I love playing in an orchestra, I mean, who wouldn't? It's such a thrill but it was never, it never felt right. I never felt right there, ever. I always felt like an imposter. And then when I started writing my own music and experimenting more on the instrument, just on my own, I finally started feeling happy, like I was supposed to be doing this, you know? And my, I can only thank my teacher, Eno, for being so understanding, because <laughs> I think most teachers would just be like, why don't you practice the repertoire? Why do you spend all this time doing this? <laughs> But he got it, he knew, he could see in me that there was something else, you know, and I wasn't, maybe I wasn't cut out for the orchestral stuff, but there was something else that I was gonna do. And um, he was right, I mean, I bumped into him at the South Bank last year, and we were both playing in the, in the venue with different artists. We were on the same level. And that was hilarious, he was like, I thought this would happen. And I was like, yeah, so if you get that imposter syndrome, there's nothing wrong with you. You know, like you can, you don't have to go any way that someone's telling you. If it doesn't feel right, if you don't feel happy, you can take a moment and listen to other kinds of music, always. Listen to music from all over the world, listen to anything. And um, it's really hard in this institutions. It's really, really hard. So don't feel ashamed for having a difficult time because I think we all did in our own ways. And, um, if you want to do something weird and everyone thinks you're a weirdo, do it. Yeah. Well, It'll work out. <laughs> I think that's great. I think that's great advice, Nina. Honestly, I'm just so pleased that like, you found, yeah, that you found your voice on this instrument because it's just such a joy to hear. And where can people go and learn more about you? Where can people hear your music and uh, support you in your journey? Um, well, I have a website, which is just www.ninaharris.com. And um, I have a lot of videos on YouTube. My album is on Bandcamp to purchase physical copies. I have LPs and CDs, and then on Spotify as well. 
Um, I don't use social media anymore, so you can't find me on there. But um, yeah, you can email me through my website if you have any questions or um, if you just want to ask, <laughs> why do you do this? Yeah. As long as you don't want to say, I bet you wish you played the flute. If you want to say that, email someone else. You don't want to hackle me. You don't want to hackle, don't hackle yeah, me. Don't hackle me through my website. Yeah. <laughs> no, but thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real, real pleasure. And what we're going to do now is we're going to wrap up by hearing you perform one of your pieces in full. I'm not quite sure which one, Ooh. but it's going to. Mm -hmm. It's going to be coming right now. So thank you so much for joining us at home. Keep practicing hard. And, you know, I hope the Nina is an inspiration for you to find your own path on your journey uh, with the double bass. So thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Sound and fury.